probably a little bit less actually. So yeah. I'm going to go ahead and call the meetings in order at uh, 4:31. Thanks everyone for coming on short notice. Um, and welcome. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Mary Lynn. Mary Lynn. I'm from yeah. Romney. Awesome. Thanks for being I think here. Chris is coming. To welcome to the executive committee. Um, are there any revisions to the agenda? Everyone received the revised agenda that Chris has sent out this afternoon with the adding an action item to accept a resolution. Okay. Are there any public comments and correspondence? Any executive committee comments? So basically, I think everyone knows we're here primarily to have some uh, preliminary discussion about the superintendent transition process. Um, you know, it's with some regret that we acknowledge that Bill has uh, submitted his resignation, um, but also some realism, so we have to kind of get started grappling with that. Um, I had a thought that there are probably some things that the executive committee should discuss in executive session before we get to the open session part of our meeting where we would talk about superintendent search and decisions that we have to make. Um, so since I'm the one with that thought, uh, I think I'll just go ahead and make the motion uh, that we move into executive session for the purposes of discussing a personnel issue and inviting anyone who's a member of the executive committee or an alternate uh, to participate in that executive session. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay. Uh, so, with regard to the superintendent transition, it seems like there are a couple of preliminary questions that we um, need to figure out. And again, we don't need to make decisions on them tonight. Um, we'll meet again tomorrow. But one in particular is: Are we interested in? Uh, trying to recruit an outside consultant uh, to work with us on the search process. It's a fairly standard thing that districts and SUs all over the state um, will do. Um, Dorothy and I spoke to a person who does that today, and it was actually very informative and illuminating, so we could talk a little bit about that. Um, and then the second question and uh, is about, you know, given where we are somewhat late in the um, school year recruiting calendar, um, and given that we are in a state of flux uh, a little bit, are we, do we think we're looking for an, an interim person, possibly for a term of a year, or are we looking for you know, someone who is longer term and is gonna step into this period of change and you know, help to kind of bring us together and through it at the same time? So I guess, to me, it seems like those are the two main questions at the moment. Um, but if other people have other... So should we speak them to one or another? Let's speak to the uh, consultant issue, I guess, yeah. yeah. Like, is, is, it, is it consultant facilitator, both the same person? Or is it consultant different from facilitator? It's the same person. It's going to be the same person. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Usually. Did that's you, why I think, usually. yeah, I, I forward Matt like four or five different yeah. possibilities. I forward um, somewhere with uh, organizations that do this, uh, one being Snelling, one being uh, NASDAQ, the New England, uh, the New England um, Staff Development Council that we're members of and I'm part of the board there. They do executive searches. So I... I had we worked with them during the last search process. That's where Brian came, came from. Yeah. from and I, I've already, sorry, sorry to. Yeah, no, I just was saying I didn't want to name any individual. I sent you some individuals too, and I, VSBA. So I want to say the three organizations. I, I already and talked to NASDAQ uh, briefly on the phone, and they sent me a sheet that lists, and I can circulate that. It lists like different levels of support and what that costs. Um, Dorothy and I met with a person this morning who happens to live nearby and was willing to give an hour of his time just to talk about, um, you know, his impressions and thoughts. Some answer our questions, like, where are we going to run off the tracks, and yeah. 
from Lake Lee and things like that. It right. was it was helpful. Right. And then I also reached out to um, a person through VB VSBA who does work for them. That this is one of their areas of specialty is sort of farming out people to help. Um, I got in touch with another consultant in Heinsberg who is not currently doing this work, but recommended another person who is. So. Mm -hmm. That's as far as I've gotten so far. So, so we should also establish something with the timetable, what we're looking at. It's going to be the third thing, I think. Okay. So is there like a, a preliminary consensus on the idea of identifying a Third party person? Yeah. It sounds like nobody's yeah. really disagreeing with that yet. Yeah. So, okay. I, I think you just don't have the time. And I think it's better. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not looking for a decision. I just want yes. things that we can yeah. say at the yeah. SU yeah. board yeah. meeting that we. Time wise. Preliminary. Yeah. So, in terms of the issue of interim versus, um, I guess, permanent is the, is the contrasting word, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, I can share again what I. Said before, mm -hmm. I, I feel pretty strongly that we need an interim, at least for a year, and uh, uh, after that, you know, that would give us like that would give us time to put our act together, get uh, our values straight, and you know, like just start to function again and heal some relationships, <coughs> and then uh, uh, we would have been out of the papers for every week. And we could have a bigger pool of candidates that would be, you know, we would know better what our destiny is to. Right now we're in the interim of delay or not delay, the board, the, the lawsuit. So it's, you know, it's pretty complicated. So I think we've, that's my personal feeling. And that would give us more time to, to work with the consultant to, you know, what, what, we, what we want, what are, you know, the board would be, We'll be in a better place. Uh, we'll be a stronger board for such an important decision, and the interim would allow the work that is going on on the schools right now to continue. I feel strongly that Tim and Kelly should remain in the position so that they can continue to support that work that has been doing. That. So it's all to me all together. So that interim should be somebody that could heal relationships. Okay. Yeah, yeah Dorothy. Um, I'm thinking that it may be people, well, they'll all know what our circumstances are, that this board is this board, but by June 30th, there'll be 10, or 15 other people that they'll have to be working with. So I think that's going to color how, whether we get interim or permanent anyway. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I really, you know, put my name in for permanent. I don't even really know at this point what I'll be that's working true. with. So I, I think we're more likely to get some candidates who are, well, I can handle this for a year mm -hmm. anyway, and then see what happens. I also support an interim, uh, but with the, and I think Dorothy raised this before, with potential for that person, mm -hmm. they could apply for the permanent position. When, but at least uh, the outset, knowing that it is an interim and is not a permanent spot. I mean. Also, who we hire into that may may determine whether it grows. And someone may say, "I just want a year um, as a transition." You know, shepherd the transition. Uh, but I think in turn would be a good idea. Yeah, I think Chris, I agree with you. I, I used to think it's an advantage to go for an interim because it lets. I mean, there is so much flux out there. We don't, and so anyone coming in, they might be, especially have if they know they have the ability to apply the full-time position later it's kind of a way of sizing up a situation and then if you don't like it you know you've got an easy out and it's i don't know that's my instinct on it but i mean there's a lot of change coming in but, i mean we're a good school district we always have i mean we're a series of good school districts we always have been this has been a hard time but it's been a hard time across the state so it's like uh i don't know it seems to me that people would see through that pretty easily but uh, I don't think the next, I don't think this year is going to be anything like we've had for the past few years. But uh, I also support an, an interim, actually, person. Um, but I just would say that you know we may 
if we go out with the search that way, we may get people who are retired but willing to do something for a year. Or we, yeah. may, we may get yeah. people who are only looking for a year-long engagement mm -hmm. of, of, of sort of clearly defined scope. You know, so I just, I'm only pointing that because it may not be possible for us to hire someone as an interim with the idea that possibly later on they would, you know, be willing to consider, you know, a sort of longer-term role. But that's, I don't think that's an argument for not mm -hmm. looking for an interim person. You know, we had an interim principal in place at Rumney, and it was tremendous. He was very open with the amount of time he wanted to put in, but he gave us great procedures in place that we hadn't had before. Um, he was really strong in some feedback of things that we were doing well and places we were really lacking, and our current principal was able to come in and put those things in place, and um, our academics is stronger because of that, so there was some real value to having that interim principal. So we're at 524. I'm sorry, Stephen. Yeah, go ahead. Well, the only thing I would say is, to me, um, part of the risk of declaring interim up front is you're assuming you can get an interim candidate who you would like. Mm -hmm. So you're narrowing what's already a small pool. <coughs> you go out for a search, realizing that you might have to settle for an interim. You get to hear from a larger pool of candidates and as Bill alluded to, you might luck out and get a couple great candidates that want the job. They right. don't want it in interim. The risk, if you just say you want interim, that's what you get, and you got to pick someone from that pool. And if you don't like that pool, you're in trouble. So I, I just think there's some advantage, disadvantage, whichever way you go. I think what, what kind of swayed me a little bit this morning talking to this guy was his his comments about the timing. Mm -hmm which is that most people are looking, you know, end of the calendar year. I, you don't need to defend. I'm not voting. No, no, I'm just, so. <laughs> but I just, just, for, just so everyone can hear it, you know. Uh, his thinking was that, you know, something conducted more along the, the typical timeline might attract 20 to 30 applications. Um, whereas if we were to put it out now, his expectation for whatever it's worth would be that we'd get half a dozen for a permanent position. So it would be a much smaller pool of people not, not to say that it might not have good people in it, or you know, but just a, a much smaller pool to, to work with. Can you wordsmith that so that it's kind of both worlds? I mean, I you know I hear what Stephen's saying, and it is kind of a crapshoot. You don't know who you could luck into. Always, yeah. I, any I mean, any recruitment is a little you don't bit know, well, yeah. It may be that they don't like us. I mean, maybe the way you do it is just offer a one-year contract, not call it intro, but say your the job is open and we're offering a one-year contract. Yeah. See if you like us and we like you. <laughs> okay, we have a, we have a lot more to discuss. Yeah. One last thing that we yeah. mentioned is that, um, and I'm, I don't love the interim. I, my ideal would be to hire someone because because we're going to have to duplicate the effort. Yeah, but. We're not the group that's going to be supervising this new superintendent, and it really strengthens the relationship with the new board to hire the person that they want. Yeah. So that supports an interim. Yeah. It does. Right. It does. Okay. Yeah. And I think in terms of the <coughs> timeline, we can take that up tomorrow. But I think the the first order of business is probably going to be identifying who can work with us as soon as humanly possible. In terms of facilitator Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bringing in options and then discussing and trying to go from there. So, so unless there is, oh, we have to accept a, a uh, resignation. Yes, we have a resignation from Jessica Jones as the program director for Zenith program. The what program? Zenith, Zenith program, or uh, as you may remember when we put in place, we called the alternative program. The name has changed oh. this year to the Zenith program. And so she's tendered her resignation. Oh. Okay. Um, is there I'll, a move that we accept? Uh, Ms. Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones um, resignation effective June 30th of yep. 2019. For a second? Jessica Johnson. Johnson, sorry, Johnson. Okay. Doing it without my packet. Jessica running. Jones would be out of a job and she wouldn't even know it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Second. I get second. Four seconds. Any discussion? All in favor? Say aye. 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 Let's have it. Thank you, and uh, without objection, we are adjourned at 528. Thanks. <coughs>
Is there a second for that, Charlie? Charlie, are you seconding that, or is it you have a discussion? Uh, you look like you had a discussion, so. It was a discussion. So let me just get a second and we'll go right there. Thank you, Charlie. I just was curious about uh, voting membership on this board. Uh, it's, so every every board has reorganized yep. for their members except for Berlin. Okay. So there are three voting members okay. from each board, and they're the ones that vote for this board. Okay. We seat everyone up front and try to keep it. The tradition has been. Right. So the three members from uh, each board that were elected to the to the Washington Central Supervisory Union and their reorganization, like we did you three too. Got it. Thank Great you. question. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. So, Phil. Yeah. Am I still a voting member? No, you are not a voting member. Your board does not reorganize. So there are Berlin, yeah. Any other questions about voting or nominations? Okay, for all those in favor of Matthew DeGroote, chair of the Washington Central Supervisory Union Board, please signify by saying aye. Any nays or abstentions? Okay, I'm not going to ask for a count. It looks like Ravy News. Congratulations, Matthew. Thanks, Bill. So we'll proceed to uh, 1.1 uh, reception of guests. Uh, there's a number of people here. The leadership team is here. We have uh, some folks I know that are here for 4.1 presenting on the Utah's Bayery. So I'm just survey day, which I appreciate. Uh, is there anyone else that's here that uh, wants to be acknowledged, wants to speak to a particular issue it's on the agenda? Yeah. Okay, thanks for coming. Uh, are there any agenda revisions or board comments? Uh, hearing none, I'll just note that uh, Unless someone on the board objects after 1.3, we'll probably move immediately to 4.1 because we have students we've invited here tonight to give a presentation and we wouldn't mind going there of their time. Uh, and then also we just know that it may be appropriate for the executive committee to get part of its report prior to discussion items 4.5 and 4.6. Any other agenda revisions? Hearing none, are there any public comments or correspondence? Uh, hearing none, then we'll come back to uh, the rest of the reorganization uh, in a few moments. But at this point, I'd like to uh, invite, invite uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to share Sherry Lugan. Sherry Lugan, thanks, got to remember that. Uh, social worker here at U32, and he's been working with a group of students uh, to look at and analyze data from the statewide and also the U32 uh, youth risk uh, behavior uh, survey. Thanks. Thank, for being here. thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, as you guys heard, I'm Sherry Luton. Um, I'm a school social worker here at U32 um, Middle and High School. And I have a couple students from the high school here, Towns to Group, a junior, and Lydia Rice, a senior. Um, we have we, do, we did have a total of um, 12 kids involved with like the planning of this, but spring sports started and everything. So we only get two tonight to come out, but there's been a lot of other kids involved in this. Um, I also have Jimmy Burley here um, from from Central Vermont Youth Directions Coalition. Um, Jimmy's been very very working pretty closely with us throughout this whole process. And I also want to acknowledge um, Pete Arsenal. He is a PE and health teacher um, here at U32, and he's been working um, through this whole process as well. He couldn't be here tonight. So basically, how we got involved with basically, um, every, every two years, Bob takes um, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Um, so we, so that, that's something that's been going on for a long time. Um, we received a grant. Jimmy and I were working together um, quite a bit last year, and we were talking about the need maybe to have a prevention program at the high school. So New Directions wrote a grant um, on behalf of U32 to try to you know work with us, give us some technical assistance and stuff to develop, you know, a, basically you know a, a youth prevention program here. 
So when school started, we were trying to figure out, like, you know, what's the best way to get going with this? We've got to recruit kids. You know, what are we going to focus on? Just trying to get ourselves organized. So through that process, um, you know, I kind of got, got some information about um, this conference that was coming up called Getting to Why. It was through, um, it's, a, it's a Montpelier agency called Up for Learning. And basically, the, the purpose of this conference was to take a team of kids. Um, there's a middle school, the middle school one and the high school one recruit a team of kids to come, attend this conference, learn how to analyze data, then come back to the school and, and do these data analysis retreats. Take, so basically taking a look at this, the youth risk behavior survey that I mentioned. So the kids, um, the kids went to this in October, and then we came back in November, December, and we held um, a data retreat for the middle school kids and for the high school kids. Um, we had over 20 kids in each group. And basically what they did was they went through this whole report and they decided, you know, what were, they were trying to come up with three of the biggest strengths here at U32, for the middle school and for the high school, and three weaknesses. Then the idea was to take a look at, you know, root causes of these things, and then brainstorm some solutions, some plans for action, things that we can do, the kids can you know, do in their communities to try to improve these, you know, some of the problems that we're having. So um, we basically did that. Um, and then um, the, ne the next step of that was basically having a community dialogue night. So we held one of them on March 12th. We invited community members, parents, um, social service agencies, um, staff, you know, staff and administration to come and brainstorm the same process the kids went, the kids went through to basically come up with solutions and you know root causes of some of these problems. Um, so it basically, we, you guys all have the executive summaries in front of you. So from that, we came up with an executive summary. Um, the stuff in bold face is basically some of the information that came out of the community dialogue night. The stuff in the regular font was some of the ideas the kids had, things that came out of the kids' retreats. Um, so basically, um, you know, we, we were here tonight and wanted to share, share some of this stuff with you. So, thank you. Um, like Sherry mentioned, mentioned, my name is Tams DeGroote. And uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, some strengths here at U32. See, because throughout this entire process, it has been very, very concern-oriented. You know, what can we improve? But we also really want to make sure that we recognize the great programs that we have here at our school and in the supervisory union that can be very, very helpful uh, for kids and students here. So an organization called the Search Institute has done a lot of research on the things they call assets. And these are uh, you know, minor things that uh, show, they've done this research that shows that when kids have these things, they do, uh, they do very well, and they do uh, much better than when they didn't have these assets. The assets include things like um, having uh, good role models or being involved in extracurricular activities, um, you know, high expectations, and uh, you know, parental involvement in their lives and in their school. Uh, we have a few sheets if you are interested in more information. So we looked at these assets, and they all fall under uh, eight categories. And uh, at, our, uh, at our student retreat, we brainstormed things that our school does that uh, supports these assets. So if you look behind you, uh, we have we, uh, all listed these down onto these pieces of paper and put them together. Uh, on the left is the middle school, on the right is the high school. And these are all programs at our school that we think uh, are helpful and represent uh, specific assets. Uh, you know, programs like uh, Blam and Glam, which are racial and LGBT inclusivity groups, respectively. Um, things like uh, middle school mentoring programs that we have here, or uh, things, uh, math, uh, various uh, school and education support systems. Uh, if you any time to if you want to take a closer look, be our guest. We have markers on a table over there. If you want to include programs that we might have missed. So uh, yes, this is just to uh, you know recognize that well there are things that we need to work on at our school. We do have a lot of amazing programs that do need uh, that deserve recognition. And uh, now Lydia is going to talk about some more strengths of ours. So why not? Hi, my name is Leah Rice, um, and so like Tom said, we held two data retreats and identified the following strengths and weaknesses. 
Um, so for the U32 middle school strengths, we had 98% um, of middle schoolers said it would be wrong to smoke at their age. 73% um, of students ate dinner with their parents seven days a week. And 60% of the students engage in physical activity daily for at least 60 minutes. Um, and then along with our strengths, we also had a few concerns for the middle schoolers. So first one was 9% overall didn't go to school because they felt unsafe at school or on their way to and from school in the past 30 days. 10% of kids made plans to kill themselves. And 20% of students have been electronically bullied. Moving on to the high schoolers, um, our three strengths were 85% of U32 students reported they had one adult in the building they could talk to, 88% of U32 students believe their parents think it's wrong to smoke, and too few students reported smoking every day to take data from compared to the Vermont average of 25%. And then along with our strengths, we also had some concerns. So 70% of U32 students reported that it was easy to access alcohol, and 38% reported being given alcohol. 22% of U32 10th graders, now seniors, reported experiencing sexual violence, double the state average of 11% for that grade. Overall, U32, 18% of students reported experiencing sexual violence compared to the state average of 10%. Um, and as many of you know, um, juuling and vaping has exploded within our U32 community. Um, and this past year, there was no data available for the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, but it has become a well-known issue. And the administration has reported to this group that the number of school disciplinary infractions due to the use of e-cigarettes has more than tripled from the previous years. And now Tom and I are gonna go over the possible solutions. So for the electronic bullying that happened in the middle school, um, a few solutions we had were restorative practices, um, opportunities for parent education, and also um, some more upstander training embedded in the curriculum, and also some more assemblies. Um, for the uh, middle school concern that uh, to, uh, many students had planned uh, suicide, we uh, brainstormed ideas around, the, uh, around uh, increasing mental health services in our school, also providing better parent education, uh, more peer mentoring opportunities, and more education for students about mental health and depression, and uh, what they can, the resources they can find in order to help them. And for the um, concern of students feeling unsafe at school, um, we have the mentor buddying system, which is currently a system where um, a high school is partnered with a middle schooler to give them extra support and they meet once a week during callback. Um, professional development for staff, upstander training for students. Uh, bouncing up to the high school, uh, the concern of too many students having access to drugs and alcohol, uh, some solutions we brainstormed are uh, parents and guardians, teaching educating parents and guardians about both being able to model healthy moderation and how to um, create better restrictions on ac uh, access to alcohol in the home. And um, also teaching kids how to uh, enjoy activities and do things that don't require alcohol or don't require uh, any drugs of any kind. Um, and for the dating and sexual violence, um, we thought that educating, having more education surrounding that no does mean no um, was important. Increasing self-confidence and um, building the Vermont network. And finally, for the issue of vaping and jeweling in our school, we uh, really want to, you know, address this at uh, very uh, significantly younger ages. So we thought that it would be good to start providing education in elementary school, also to educate teachers on, on how to identify usage and harmful effects of vaping and drooling, and finally uh, to educate uh, teachers uh, as well on the effects and how to prevent kids from vaping and drooling. And now Sherry is going to speak about what we've done so far and what we'll do soon. Thanks, guys. Um, actually, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny Burley for a couple minutes because she had she has spent a little time going through um, the survey and just wanted to um, you know share a little bit more information with you guys. 
Thanks, Sherry, and thanks to the students. In the 20 some years that New Directions has been monitoring the uh, YRBS, working with the area schools, this is the first time we've had students go to getting to Y, so it's pretty exciting to have this level of involvement. One of the frustrating things about the YRBS is that 20 years ago, we used to take it in the spring and get the results the following fall. Now we get them the fall after that. So this is 2017 stuff we're looking at. And it's outdated. They didn't even know what a jewel was when they wrote this survey. So um, it, it's frustrating to not have really current information. So I just went through the data and pulled out some data points about U32, both middle and high school, but mostly high school, where U32 had because I'm a problem solver and not much of a booster. Um, I was looking for where are we worse than, than other places in the state. So I'm just gonna call out a few places where our data is not so much to be proud of. Um, experience sexual violence. Ever misused prescription stimulants. We have high numbers. Misused a prescription drug within the past 30 days were offered, sold, or given an illegal drug in the past year at school. Um, let's see, I think it is very wrong or very wrong to smoke marijuana. We have a low number, so students don't think it's wrong. Easy to get marijuana, that's 66%, say it's easy to get. Easy to get alcohol, 70%, say that. Uh, we have pretty high screen time rates, students using a lot of TV, computers, video games, etc. On the other hand, we are outstanding at eating fruits and vegetables and not drinking sweet beverages. And a couple other good news, and this is not always typical of teenagers, they have at least one adult that they can talk to at the school, and they feel that they matter to the community, and that's 70%. And when we first started looking at this, it was more likely in Vermont to be down around 40-something percent. So that's really good progress. And I think those are, yeah, so those, those perceptions of harm, thinking it's wrong or very wrong to do these things, those are important risk factors that can be addressed um, before students actually take action on that. And parental input on those issues is really important. Your kids, even though they won't tell you, they listen to what you say and they know what you think. So it's it's really worth mentioning it to them. Thanks, Sherry. So I just want to spend just a few minutes talking about like what our next steps are going to be. Um, basically, we kind of, we thought it was important to obviously get through this process and see sort of what we're dealing with here. Um, we were going to have a group of middle school and high school students that were going to meet um, weekly for the rest of the school year and start, you know, sort of tackling some of these, some of these, some of these issues. Um, so, so some of the couple of things that we're already working on, I just wanted to share was in terms of the vaping. Um, I attended a, a conference on Monday along with a school nurse um, around uh, this is basically to get trained in that program. Um, cessation program for tobacco. So we're hoping to start that within the next week or two to offer kids that are addicted to nicotine, um, you know, the opportunity to get some get some help for that to be able to stop. Um, we took some middle school kids a couple weeks ago to a middle school bullying conference up in Burlington, and they attended different some different um, you know, different individual trainings. One of which was around cyberbullying. So they have some ideas. So we, you know, that's one thing we're trying to educate the kids on what they can do a little bit more. Um, we hope to take some high school kids to um, a dismantling rape conference up at UVM um, in April to hopefully get some ideas around, you know, some things we can do here to provide some education around, you know, dating violence and healthy relationships. Um, we also have a circle is going to do a program with the kids, which is like um, it's a social media program where the kids, kids, I don't know all the details, you have to take pictures of like adults that they can talk to about these these kinds of issues and they share it on social media and there's hashtags and all that stuff, which we know is what the teenagers like. So this is a program that we're gonna be doing hopefully soon um, around some of that. Um, also the middle school is gonna be participating in like, a ghost out at some point this spring where we, we provide some, we, um, the kids are, basically the kids are going to take a look at how many deaths are caused by opiates 
and then we're going to follow it up with like an assembly where the kids, um, you know, we're going to spend some time talking about, you know, what do we do, like, you know, where can we take medications and stuff and dispose of them, and where can they go and get, you know, get help and just provide some education around that. So those were a few of the things we kind of hope to do between now and the end of the school year. Um, but we sort of see these efforts continuing probably at least through the middle of next year. And then once we get you know, our next set of data, we'll kind of take another look at that and see how it's changed and, and kind of go from there. So I just want to thank you for hearing us tonight. Thank you, Sherry and Jenny and Leah and Towns. I want to give board members a chance to offer any comments or ask any questions they may have. But I just want to point out a couple of things that really struck me the first time that I saw this presentation. Yeah. Um, and uh, so Stephen, I'm not sure, completely on the spot, but an approximate number of people in our current graduating class of seniors. So, so the current senior class yeah. is about 120. 120. Yes. Okay. So the. Um, this survey was taken when the seniors were sophomores. Correct. And so the data relates to that the high school data. Correct. It does. Uh, so that stat that 22% of students uh, had experienced a sexual assault by the time essentially they were 16 uh, seemed remarkable to me. That, that, that can... Well, the survey would have included the juniors and seniors that ah. were here at the time, too. Okay, so that's just, just yeah. Still 22% overall. That So we're talking about 25 kids, basically, out of the 120 um, had experienced that by 16. And then, of course, the statistic that 10% you know, of our 7th and 8th graders had made plans to die by suicide. And this is at the age of 12 or 13, I think also really, really jumped out at me. Um, and that's not to discount any of the things you've said about the wonderful assets that the schools have and the positive things that are happening. And I appreciate the solutions that you work to identify and are pursuing. Um, but those were just the things that really hit me. I think I wasn't really aware of those issues. But are there any other board members who want to? Yeah. Um, I'm Johnny Waterhouse from the Dirty Board. I just want to thank you so much, those of you who helped bring getting to the Y to E32. I think this is such a great program and really great work that you all are doing. And. Um, one of the things about YRBS data that I think is really helpful is that it really shows often disproportionality for students of color and LGBTQ students who often on some of these questions, are, you know, the data shows that the experiences of harm and support are disproportionately um, disadvantaging students of color and LGBTQ students. And then I think that probably also impacts the types of solutions that a school is going to need to really invest in in order to try to um, correct some of that inequity. I'm just curious if how that looked in your data. Um, is this, yeah, are you asking about uh, how, the, how race and uh, sexuality and uh, gender can affect, how, how that affected the data? Yeah, like I, <coughs> I've seen some YRBS data that just shows that on many of oh, the questions, for it, example, sexual harm, that students of color and LGBTQ students report much higher rates oh, okay. and are less likely to, are more likely to feel unsafe at school and less likely to have someone at school that they feel like they can talk to. So just all these different yeah. places where you see that disproportionality and then the solutions have to account for that in some way. So I'm just curious about how that came up in your conversations. Um, when we were at the Getting to Y conference, we uh, talked a lot about, uh, talked a lot about how different things can affect the data and how different, uh, uh, different how, how, yeah. And it is very, very clear how uh, race, how race and um, being uh, and sexuality and gender can affect the data. The, the rates of bullying um, against LGBTQ uh, kids is, are just astounding. Um, it, it was significantly higher than the uh, rates of bullying against uh, uh, non-LGBTQ kids, and. Um, there, there was a significant, significant problem with kids of color being afraid of coming to school. So uh, I think that it, we are out, know if we're doing enough to recognize that right now, but it is a very, very important thing, and um, it, it's very good that you talked about that. Thank you.
I wanted to thank you too. And then I have a question in the bigger picture. How does the, the why that we found out integrate with the work in trauma that we're doing as a, you know, how does the soul, does this information inform that process too? Or are both groups working eight minutes? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question? So uh, we, as a supervisory union, we have been doing a lot of work, uh, teachers and through Kelly Bushy on uh, on trauma. And uh, I don't know if this, is re this information relates to how we service those kids or how we put things in, uh, you know, acknowledging how we treat kids, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. So the support systems that we're trying to create are, does this, uh, are, are you guys talking? <laughs> That's my question. Sorry. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, so are you talking just about like our support systems within the school? Just had a quick question, um, and this might seem to sound like a silly question, but do students consider vaping smoking? And does your data reflect that? Um, so it's actually a really interesting question. We talked about this um, at our community night, and specifically about the jewel. And we um, talked about the fact that if you walked up to a high school student and you asked them, is it cool to smoke cigarettes? And they would say, no, that's disgusting. That's gross, like we would never do that. But then you ask them, would you like to jewel? And they're like, oh yeah, that's fine. And there's not that clear distinction between the fact that the stuff you're putting in your body is may not smell like cigarettes, but it is similar stuff. And there's even stuff in there that no one knows about. Um, so it's just trying to educate kids on the fact that it is not a healthy alternative. Um, You know, the not training I went to was interesting because that originally was about smoking. And they're trying to kind of revise that to include vaping. And, you know, they were looking at the statistics about, you know, you smoking just continues to go down. We've done a really nice job in Vermont and I think across the country with that. But now we have this whole other thing of the, you know, of the vaping that's emerged. And, you know, one thing we said to the kids at this data retreat was, if there's something you know that's going on in your school, then maybe the data, because there was some questions about e-cigarettes on this, on this current 2017 survey. There's a lot more than the one the kids took a couple weeks ago, a lot more questions around that. But I said to the kids, is there other problems you know of in the school that we all know that maybe, you know, the data is telling, you know, it's, it's like the data wasn't showing that in 2017, but there wasn't a lot of questions, you know, so the kids are like, we know this is, you know, this is a huge problem, you know, so. They, they kind of you know, went with that, identified that problem based on what they're seeing here at school and their experiences and what we know from administration and stuff. We have time for one more question. Go ahead. So uh, I guess my, my question is around uh, this information, these statistics are startling, uh, you know, uh, alarming. Uh, and I guess some, there's something, there's some, some proactive work being done um, here at U32 to address this, but uh, when you have kids who are, uh, you know, 13, 14, who want to kill themselves, uh, and you have kids that are 16 that are experiencing sexual violence at such rates, to me it sounds like a more systemic problem that doesn't just live within this building. And I'm just been curious to know how we, there may be thoughts or plans to, to appropriately address this so you know, students at the younger grades coming up aren't, you know, this isn't the culture and the environment that they're coming into. Yeah, so um, part of our solutions did involve um, building emotional supports into our curriculum. Uh, and then Towns and I are also going to the um, 
rape conference about rape culture and um, trying to build a healthy relationship environment within U32. Um, but you're right, it definitely does start within um, the elementary schools and that's just one of our solutions is that we think that this needs, we are seeing like issues obviously in the high school, but it needs to start earlier. And so just building that is important. So two weeks ago, I went with a team of 10 other Vermonters to Iceland to see how they managed to change their culture and go from the worst underage drinking rates in Europe to the lowest in 20 years. And I would be happy to come and, and show you, share with you how they did it. Um, but it really is about, it's not a curriculum. It is a culture change where families step up and say, this is how we're going to do it. And you're not gonna stay out all night anymore drinking. And the state would put in, they actually put in place a youth curfew. And family groups went around their neighborhoods and enforced it. So if you really do want to tackle this, it takes a cultural change in the values of the community. So I, I just really want to thank you again. I could probably spend a lot more time talking about this. Unfortunately, we have a very full agenda, but I, I just want to encourage you. I know you're working with many other uh, students here at U32 on this, uh, and I thank you two for coming. Um, I'll just also just want to suggest that uh, if you do have ideas or thoughts or even just want to discuss, you know, what might possibly move the needle on these issues or change things for the better, um, please think of the school board as a place to bring that information or those questions or those suggestions. I'm sitting next to the uh, chair of the U32 board. Uh, he's a pretty good guy. You probably work. I'm trying to get something on their agenda as well. Um, so again, just really appreciate your, your being here and sharing this, this data and your analysis of it. It's great. It's a treat for us. Thanks. Thank you. So at this point, we'll jump back up to section two the rest of the, uh, the organization. Um, we can move each of these positions or we can move them as a, as a slate. Is there anybody who would like to make nominations for these positions? Vice Chair, Clerk, and Treasurer. I, I will say that people are interested in knowing the Executive Committee did uh, vote to recommend to the SU Board that uh, Kari, uh, again, be uh, elected the vice chair, or nominated for vice chair, I should say, that Chris McVeigh be nominated for, for clerk, and that Mary Ormsby be uh, nominated for treasurer. So I would move that slate. Okay, so we have Carl uh, moving that slate for candidates, and Dorothy seconding. Uh, are there other nominations? Is there any discussion on that nomination? Uh, hearing no discussion, uh, all those in favor of electing the slate of Carrie Bradley for vice chair, Chris McVeigh for clerk, and Mary Ormsby for treasurer, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, 2.5 is to establish the time and day of regular monthly meetings. So I would recommend, Matthew, that it's been the tradition of Washington Central to usually have it on the fourth Wednesday for either the executive committee or the supervisor union board. And we, past couple years, have found success in moving it to 530. Uh, Dorothy, uh, so moved for the fourth, fourth Wednesday at 530, Chris McVeigh seconds. Is there any discussion? Hearing on all those in favor of establishing the fourth Wednesday of each month at 5 30, the regular monthly meeting of the SU board, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Yes, have it. Uh, 2.6. Uh, we were asked to appoint a statewide representative to be high in DSBA a little bit earlier this year. Um, so, do 
you want to see my talk to about The, the wording is a little confusing there, but the, the delegate's role is to vote or ratify an agreement negotiated by the commission. So it's not, we're not, a, the members to, to that board to do the actual negotiating have been appointed. So we are just a delegate that ratifies the negotiations that have been taken place. Did I make, did I make, did I clarify it? No. <laughs> not quite for me. So. So as most of you are aware, um, state statute change and require that health care be negotiated on a statewide basis. The SBA is looking for represent a representative from every supervisory union slash supervisory district to ratify the agreement once it's done for the health care piece. They have the negotiation team already. And so Washington Central needs to appoint a person to do that and to be your representative at that work of ratifying the health care negotiations once they're done. And another thing is that that delegate will be able to cast their vote electronically. So it's a little different. So whoever that person is, don't feel like you're going to have to go to a lot of meetings. There will be a webinar, and then you can cast your vote electronically. In the past, we have used, it was a different system, but a superintendent has been appointed person to the Beehive, but in this case, it has to be a board member, and it doesn't have to be anybody that is in negotiations. It could be, but the negotiations are taking part at the state, like Bill said. So it's, it's, it's like similar to what we're doing today. We then board and ratify the negotiations that our negotiation team has done. Um, is there any reason why you, as our rep to the BSBA, could not also serve as our rep for healthcare negotiations? No, there's no reason. Yeah. Would you be willing to be uh, nominated? I don't know if there are any. Uh, I would nominate Floor to serve as our rep for the high and BSBA healthcare negotiations. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for Floor D. S. Smith to serve as our representative in these negotiations. Any discussion? So my my question is when would be the first time that this representative would be required to meet? Well, negotiations are starting in April, and I don't know when they're going to get done. So it's at the end of the process. It's not at the beginning of the process. It's not the way we do negotiations here. It's more a ratifying. It's more a ratifying piece than it is anything else. They are, as Flora said, they already have their negotiation team that's negotiating. I, I asked the question. Because with the uncertainty of who's going to be board members in June, can we even elect a board member at this time? So we have to. Yeah, I think you need to right now, and I think that you could, if that were to change, you could change it at that point. Yeah. Otherwise, we would be giving away our one vote. So I think we, I think we have to, and then. A part of the process right now is keeping everybody informed of the process because nobody really knows exactly how it's going to go in the first year. So who who appointed the negotiators and where did they come from? I, I can go back to the whole thing because I don't want to lie to you. I'll just open it so I can tell you. But it's, I like it's, that too. Yeah, no, so it, it's, it's just statewide and there was that. So Beehive, BSBA, um, the state, That's about, about everybody got to a point. A, a lot of people that were appointed to this uh, uh, to this positions have been doing negotiations for for years. So there's no. Uh, I, I'll tell you exactly what what who they are. Just have to. You can move on to something else if you want. Well, I just pull that out. Uh, we do have a motion on the table. This pretty much is our topic of discussion until we discuss it. Okay, so hold on one minute. Right on the slide. While floor is looking, are there any other questions about this? So, floor, is there one 
of representatives from each supervisory union in the state that votes to ratify? No. Uh, oh, vote, vote to ratify. Vote to yeah, ratify. Every, every supervisory union or district gets one vote. Okay. And then is who, I'm assuming the teachers have? So Ver to Vermont, ratify? Vermont, well, the Vermont NEA represents every education person every educator in the state, so not only people that are in their membership, but the administrative team that you see here, the ESP, if they're covered by a different association, so they represent everyone that's a, uh, that's why the superintendents and the principals association cannot be part of the negotiation for the board side. Okay. Is there any uh, reporting to the board uh, during the negotiation process? Because it sounds like you're not the one negotiating. But they're, they're, I'm assuming they'll report to you, or is it is the process kind of a closed process, and we find out at the end what the result is, and then you vote yay or nay on the result. So I, you know, I, I, I can send you the whole thing that I was sending the email back. And this was something that happened in the fall, <coughs> so it was in the newsletter in the fall for the SBA. But it, basically. They have to start negotiations, and I'm just going to read you a little bit. The commission must select a person to serve as the fact finder to assist in resolving any matters remaining to dispute if the commission is unable to reach an agreement. So we really don't have uh, a say. We're giving our uh, negotiation to, to these people that have been appointed. That we did have a say in who they were at the regional meeting, but they were appointed, like I just said, by the NEA. BSBA and the uh, and BHI. So the, com the commission is required to enter into a written agreement incorporating all the matters agreed in the negotiation. And they're gonna start work on April 5th. That's as much information that we have. And, uh, and, and uh, I'll tell you exactly. The representative of schools and school employees must each develop procedures by which members will ratify the agreement into the commission. If the agreement is determined by arbitration, it's not subject to ratification. So, so yes, there's going to be more. Uh, there's going to be more information through the process. I can send you the whole. I just don't want to take the entire knowing. Okay. That's so the one, one last question in terms of how long a period of time are we talking about? Is it annual or is it multi-year? So the way that they have it right now is that the Act 11, which is what this is, a, the all collective bargaining agreements, not just health insurance provisions between SU and SD and school employees shall expire between July 2020 and September 2020. So it's just that one year. Well, no, I think Chris was a different question. You're asking how long the, the, the health care negotiation? Yes. So I think oh, it okay. depends on the negotiations. Okay. How far they go? Yeah. I don't think there's a. So they, there's no cap on that. Issue. No, I mean what what Act 11 did was put the negotiating of healthcare at the state level, um, with and it really it it put it right with this in, into state government and VI and VSBA have been asked to come in as part of it. I think I'd have to go yeah. back to look exactly if they were named under the Act or not as partners. And I can send to everybody who is in this commission for the entire state. And the other thing is that the arbitrator that's going to guide this process has to put out something by November 15th. So that could give you a little bit of a timeline. Okay, thank you. Is there any other discussion on the motion? <coughs> Are we ready for the question? On the motion of uh, appointing Floor Diaz Smith to vote on behalf of the SU in statewide uh, healthcare negotiations. Uh, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to 3.1. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of February 13th? So moved. Chris, thanks. Is there a second? second. Even? Is there a discussion of the minutes which I believe are here on page three and four and five? Um, I have one. 
correction in item 3.3 .3, um, in the first sentence where it says to narrow the scope of work. It should say having narrowed the scope of work. Any other comments, discussion? Uh, Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes of February 13th, 2019, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Don't choose the ayes have it. So we'll go to um, 4.2, which is reviewing our supervisor and union board norms. These are on page six of the packet. Those of you who have served on the board in past years, uh, at least the past couple of years, these will look familiar to you. Um, we have adopted these norms each year. We sometimes struggle to follow them, to be honest. Um, but I think the ones about community involvement, I think the aspiration, at least, to start and end on time uh, is a good one. Um, that all voices get heard. Uh, three, three people speaking. or uh, talk about these we can, or if someone wants to move that we re-adopt them, we can do that as well. I would move that we adopt the current board norms. Stephen has moved that we adopt uh, these board norms. Is there a second? Board? Thanks. Is there a discussion? Mayor, an issue that I had with these, I uh, raised at the U32, I rolled the board at the end of the board meeting, reflecting over the board statement, I love the throughout the meeting to ensure aligned to the rules of not spending too much time in the week. That's fine, but that's, the role of the board is greater than that. It, it, it's constant, it, and it, it's, um, it's contained in our oaths, and it's in, contained in the concept that we set policy and, and, and broad, um, broad policy goals for uh, the union as a whole. So I, I just want to make note of the fact that I think referring to this as the role of the board is a little misleading. Maybe it's the, you know, the function, the, the uh, activity of the board at a particular meeting. The role of the board is greater than that. That's all. If I follow you, Charlie, I'm not suggesting a change. You just sort of know the distinction of the... Yeah. Any other comments? Ready for the question? Uh, all those in favor of adopting uh, the norms for the supervisor and union board, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Mentions? Ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, 4.3, the 2019-20 school year calendar. Sorry, Mom. Sorry. Stephen was asking a question about that. Um, so one of the things that we um, we must do by statute is be in alignment with the Central Vermont Career Center. And one of the things that we've all been experiencing this year with, and we experienced one on Friday, is the number of snow days that we've had. We're currently up to seven at U32. Um, and that's putting us into the last week of June for school. So, um, if we had followed the traditional pattern that we've had every other year, we would stop our last day of school on June 16th for students and June 17th for teachers. Seeing that, uh, I worked with the associations and our Labor Management Council to say, how can we move two days out of that third week so that we could end school on Friday without any snow days, end school on Friday, June 12th? and asked them for their best suggestions. And they came back to reducing a day in October so that we we're actually in school on, on Columbus Day. And that uh, in January that we move in service back onto Martin Luther King Day. Um, we had a lot of discussion on that because two years before we had a lot of discussion about we really want to honor 
uh, Dr. King's great ideals. And where we came on is that we're, for the half day of in-service, there's a required by contract, a half day of grading that day, but for that half day that the in-service would be focused on uh, just, ju justice, bias, uh, anti-bias work, uh, youth empowerment, something along the ideals of Dr. King. So we are proposing, and the leadership agreed with that leadership team. So um, I'm bringing you this calendar. I know that will be a change for some families uh, from what they normally have been used to in the past couple of years. Uh, there's been some extra long weekends there and they won't be quite as long, but uh, the, and I think that I'll be talking to most of you as board members about this year's calendar at a later date. But as I tell everybody, I don't, I plan on snow days could still happen in the first couple of weeks of April. I've experienced them within the past couple of years. So we're hoping not. It's the combination of the mud and the snow. So this is the count. That was the real objective of this calendar is to get us back to where the last student day is the Friday and the second week in June. And we must be in alignment across the super across the central uh, Central Vermont Career Center for 175 days. This calendar does it. Bill, those changes you just discussed are reflected in the calendar. They're in the calendar that you have in front of you. This year's school calendar will be will be discussed or determined it, it, later. It may be. It may be, Katie. It's one of those things of um, one of my values is that we keep kids in school as much as possible. So I've been a hard one to. We have 180 days required to have 175. We may have that discussion later on because right now we're ending on a Monday. Uh, youth Thirty Two is making up a day next week because they have an in service where there's parent. Teacher negotiations is on the discussion agenda and also 5.6 on the reports to the board. And I wonder if that was intentional. And if so, okay. So, it, so, um, but I think our intent, and I want to make sure that this is correct, is to, for to, for the whole everybody to get to hear efficiently what the results of the negotiations were and have a chance to ask questions before going back into their local boards to ratify. Yeah, I'll add some more after you discuss it. Okay. Okay. So, um, as you all know, we worked with the association using a consensus-based decision-making process called interest-based bargaining to get to this agreement. Um, I, I just wanted to name the negotiating team on the board side was Carl from U32, Stephen from East Montpelier, Vera from Berlin, Chris from Middlesex, and Susanna from Callas, and myself, and also really acknowledge um, Bill and Lori and their team who just put in a huge amount of work to help us understand the issues that we were looking at and get to an agreement that everyone could live with. Um, and so the main features of this agreement are that um, we worked to um, address some of the association's concerns around how the health insurance package was um, impacting association members and how to make it work better for their association members overall while keeping it essentially cost neutral. And the way that we did that was um, with an agreement where employees are paying a higher percentage of the premiums in exchange for 
no out of pocket. So the employer <coughs> is covering the out of pocket expenses and paying less of the premiums. And again, this was what we heard from the association was that overall this would work better for their members, like, and that was a really important issue for them. So um, it was a place where we were able to come to agreement. And then there, this, there's also a um, the salary increase represents 3.1% increase in new money, which then gets put into the salary scale. So um, depending on where you are in the grid, your the faculty and staff experience a different increase. And then uh, the last thing I just want to say about this in, as a report um, is that the negotiations process, I think, gives us board members the chance to hear directly from faculty and staff about their experience of working for these institutions that we uh, oversee. And one of the things that it helped clarify for me is how essential it is for us as board members to be thinking about all the ways that we reflect back to the people that are employed in these institutions that we are really grateful for their service and we really admire their professionalism and all the ways that they contribute to the educational mission that we set out. And that the benefit, salary and benefits package and other elements of the agreement are one of the ways that um, the faculty and staff kind of experience communications from the board. Um, but that there are many other ways that we could be proactively communicating that gratitude and admiration for them and their professionalism and their skill. So I, I think it's a great reminder for all of us to be um, taking advantage of those opportunities. Did you want to say anything else, Bill? Thank you, thank you, Johnny. And, and uh, Johnny and Susanna are great partners to work with. They do a great job leading that for all of you. Um, I just wanted to give a process piece, Matthew, if you don't mind, just a bit. Um, we've done this the past couple of times where we presented the teacher contract. Our goal is to be able to put contracts in teachers' hands with, um, so they don't have letters of intent. So one of the reasons we're doing this tonight, I think most of the boards, except for U32, you have a one agenda item because it's, it's ratified by, your, by the uh, local boards, that you can all just stay in this room. As we've done it some other times. Huddles, have your clerk take some minutes. You really just need to approve it vote on it and be done. I think that's everyone's agenda pretty much. Um, doesn't mean you can't, you could do something else if you'd like to, um, I'm not saying that, but uh, that's the process that would happen right at the close of this meeting. Uh, I know U32 needs to go for another issue to your regular room. I don't know if there's any questions. I, I, just, I, thought, I thought you started to say you wanted to put the uh, contracts in the teacher's hand by date, but I Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. April 15th. We have to do it by April 15th, and if we miss that, we have to give them letters of intent. And I don't want to go through a two-cycle piece. That's why we're trying to get this through. They've ratified it a couple of schools already, and they're going to be done by Friday, ratifying it, hopefully. <laughs> so basically, there's no action to be taken here, or is it just briefing for the meeting? That we're, we're, we're trying to do the discussion all at once. Are there any questions for Chai or Bill or other members of the negotiations committee for that matter? Just appreciation and thank you, thank you for the many hours. Yeah, so just to say that through the mic, just appreciation and noting just the amazing number of hours that go into serving on the negotiations committee is uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, let's move on to Act 46 update, which um, is a bit vague for a topic that's somewhat complicated. Um, if no one objects, I'll, I'll try to do my best to just give an overview, I guess, of the developments since our last SU meeting, uh, in the knowledge that everyone here will be honest if I make a mistake or say something that being interpreted differently than they would interpret it. Um, I believe our last meeting was on the 13th of February, and the, uh, there was an organizational meeting for the Washington Central Unified Union School District on the 19th, uh, at which shortly after uh, adopting rules of, uh, Robert's Rule of Order for the meeting, there was a motion to adjourn until an event certain, event being 
ruling of the uh, judge in the uh, pending suit uh, contesting some aspects of Acts uh, 46 and 49, as well as the uh, process by which uh, it's been carried out by the Agency of Education and this, the State School Board. Um, that ruling was issued on uh, March 4th. Uh, the judge denied motion for preliminary injunction or stay, uh, and also issued a, a sort of non-binding, I guess I would call it, um, you know, series of comments on the, the merits of the suit, uh, but has not yet ruled uh, on the suit uh, formally or finally. Uh, the, there has been another uh, organizational meeting scheduled for April 8th, attempt to take up the business that's uh, warned for that meeting. Um, I guess I would also note that I think also many people are aware there's been some activity in the legislature over the last several weeks. Uh, so the House had already passed a bill that uh, permitted uh, delays of the um, effective operational dates of uh, districts that have been ordered to merge under different circumstances. Uh, the Senate has now also passed a bill uh, which would allow for delays to take place under different circumstances than those listed in the House bill, uh, as well as dealt with some issues around uh, budget and so on. Uh, so my understanding is that now those, um, that would be taken to conference committee and the differences in the bills would be ironed out by um, a group of representatives from the House and the Senate to see if they can arrive at a compromise Those are the, the facts, more or less. Um, I guess I would offer one editorial comment, which is that um, it is my impression that the organizational meeting on April 8th um, probably is our last opportunity to put in motion a chain of events that will allow us to have a voter-approved budget uh, for uh, unified meeting before it became operational on July 1st. Um, so I just wanted to note that that seems to be the case. I think if, the, if that meeting doesn't happen or that meeting happens and is adjourned before business is, is conducted, I don't think there will be another opportunity uh, for us to put a budget in front of voters. Um, so if anyone else wants to, so that is where we are at. If anyone wants to speak to the issue um, or say other things about it, I am one of the people who have been fighting Act 46. I just wanted to note that I agree with what you said. Lord? Do we need to have a conversation about the organizational meeting? Anything that we have to have in place? Or are we going to have legal counsel? Or I, I think there were a couple of things that we talked. I, I, I can pull out my notes, but we. The technical committee met and we had a couple of questions. Yeah, you've reminded me about a couple of things. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. I did forget. The executive committee met last week and um, we passed a couple of motions um, specifically asking Bill to reach out to the attorney with uh, some questions that we had. Um, so, one question related to, um, I can look at the minutes, but essentially the, the question we had was, wanted to know the lawyer's uh, written opinion about uh, the circumstances under which, if there are any, that the Agency of Education or the State Board of Education can take over uh, a school district or school districts. Um, the reason we put that question out was because uh, there were some quotes in the paper a couple of weeks ago, approximately, by Secretary French to the effect that districts and voters did not move to, um, you know, put the, um, the newly ordered districts uh, onto a track of being successfully operational by the date set in the law, uh, that you would consider something like all possible legal means um, for making sure the law is carried out. Um, that 
seem to some of us like an implicit threat uh, to, or explicit threat, <laughs> depending on whichever word you prefer, um, of assuming control of the, uh, of the school system if they are capable of doing that. So we asked, we wanted the lawyer's opinion on um, whether that can be done and under what circumstances it can be done. Um, the second question that we uh, wanted to put to the lawyer was uh, simply what are the implications for The answer to that question is somewhat of a moving target because as I mentioned, you know, there is a bill that's been passed by the Senate and it's still under consideration which would um, actually lay out exactly what the implications of that would be. Um, so that may be superseded by legislation um, at some point during this, this session, that question but it still seems worth uh, having an answer to. Um, there was a question yeah, that came up at the executive committee about uh, whether we wanted to ask you legal counsel to be present for the meeting. Uh, I think that caused some controversy last time. Um, so that was something that uh, we had talked about bringing up here. Yeah, I forgot about that thing before. Um, so I don't know if anybody had any comments or thoughts on, on that. Well, by the way, I should say that we, we the executive committee met last Wednesday. Uh, the request went out to the attorney on Thursday. He hasn't had time to write a formal written opinion on those questions as yet. We did receive an email from him about five minutes before this meeting uh, with some bulleted thoughts, but I haven't had a chance to read it or digest it or even look at it really. So. Question. Yeah, I have. I can read it. Yeah, like. Just gotta wait for me to boot up my computer. I had a question, Matthew. Uh, I was wondering about the answer, but is the the budget for the new merged unified district something that would be determined by the new merged board sometime between after they're elected and before the first. Is that the assumption or is there a process for developing that budget? Uh, the, the voters of the new union district would have to approve that budget. Uh, the new board would have to warn that vote. So that's how that works essentially. So the organizational meeting one of the items of business, I believe, is to set a date for the election of new board members. And then once the new board members are elected, uh, they would have to warrant a vote with the electorate uh, to adopt or reject a, a budget, a draft budget. Um, and what was the second part of the question? Oh, yes. So there is a process uh, defined in um, Act 49 specifically, I believe, where there is, there is this transitional board to the article, so you call it um, that uh, basically two members from each of the existing six district boards were uh, you know, uh, appointed to this transitional board. It literally has no authority or power, um, but it's charged with trying to work on drafting a budget for the new district for the new board once it's elected. So uh, I sent the questions off to Chris Leopold on Thursday, and right at the beginning he said, he had told me on Thursday he wasn't sure he could get a written opinion back here by today uh, with the other work that he had on his desk. Um, but he's able to provide some very preliminary assessments. So what is the method or process that either the State Board or Secretary of Education can take over control of the school district? The authorization in Title 16 appears to be limited to the school quality standards. Uh, 16 BSA section 165B authorizes the secretary to assume administrative control only to the extent necessary to, to correct deficiencies. There are notice and, uh, notice and related provisions prior to such an assumption. In my opinion, this statutory authorization is incapable to a newly established school district. Uh, he also says, I'm also reviewing other potential avenues for the secretary of the board to take over control of the school district. That's the answer to that question. The second question, if a new school district does not have a budget by July 1st, 2019, what are the implications for a district to pay obligations? 16 BSA section 566 authorizes the school board to borrow funds in the absence of a voter approved budget by June 30th. 
Under this statute, the board is authorized to borrow funds ne necessary to operate schools in an interim budget, interim budget up to 87% of the most recently approved school budget. Given the wording of this statute, there are questions as to whether the statute is word worded applies to new school districts. If so, what is the spending threshold? The Vermont legislature is presently considering this issue. The House passed H39, which authorizes borrowing and spending at 87% of the cumulative total of the forming districts in the prior year. The Senate has passed a version of H39, authorized an interim budget, and borrow at 100% of the cumulative total of the funding of forming school districts in the prior year, plus an adjustment for the average statewide spending increase from the prior year. The agency establishes the budget and the school board determines borrowing needs and spending decision. The bill will most probably go to a conference committee to resolve the difference. In the event the legislature does not pass H39 or the issue is not resolved, the VSA, 16 VSA section 563.2 authorizes a school board to take any action for the sound administration of the school district. The Secretary of Education, with the advice of the Attorney General, shall decide whether any action can, can, contemplated or taken is required for the sound administration. The decision of the Secretary shall be final. This may be an alternate vehicle for addressing the issue of budget and borrowing. Lastly, if a new school district does not have a board by July 1st, 2019, what are the implications for a district, sorry, I have a little techie problem right now. Um, for a district to access and review to pay obligations and run operations for a school district. Under the Articles of Agreement for Washington Central Unified Union School District, the transitional school board serves until there is an elected school board is seated. Under the provisions of Article 9C1, the transition board has the same authority as the WCUUSD school board under the Articles and otherwise by law. It is my opinion that in the absence of, newly <coughs> school, of a newly school board by July 1st, 2019, the transitional board may exercise those responsibilities. And then Chris says, okay, if you, want, if you would like more of this written up, he's more than willing to send a written opinion. Thanks, Stephen. I'm just returning to the issue of the attorney being present at the uh, initial meeting. I don't know if that's something you want to specifically speak to. Or no, I, I, it was just to pose the question to everybody because if we're going to, you know, if there's a process by which we can just allow him to vote once to allow him to speak and be there as a consultant, even if it's necessary, it doesn't, it sounds like you're giving us all the information right now. So I'm, I'm just trying to be prepared one way or another. If if there's a process in their official meeting by why we can vote once to let him speak when needed, or we don't need, we would have a list more specific this time and we don't need him there, I, I, I really don't know. So I'm asking that, I don't, you know, I don't want to be the one making that decision. I'm just speaking out loud what, what would be the best approach for the day of the meeting. I think if we wanted to specifically ask the attorney to be there, we would need a motion. And then we would have to approve that motion and we could ask him to be there. It would be up to the voters whether or not the attorney would be able to speak or not if he's not from within our our, uh, our district, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, Unified Union yeah. District. Yeah. Um, yes, Kennedy. At the last meeting, if I were him, I wouldn't come back the way he was treated. And if we have to pay him to there, I feel like it's a it's a waste of money if people refer to him as him, that man. You know, I, I just think he was treated so poorly that, in my opinion, it's not worth paying somebody to come and not be able to talk. Okay. I guess I personally feel. Waters are treading are so soupy these days that the advice of any one lawyer at a given moment is pretty transient. And I guess I would argue that, to my mind, it's probably not worth his time driving over here and our money having him there. I think we're just going to have to battle our way through <coughs> any sticky points that come up and do our best to interpret what's in front of us for our.
you're satisfied. Okay. I have one more question. Yeah. Um, Sometimes you can to the lawyer we asked failed for this meeting to have a, the instructed failed to also facilitate daycare at the organizational meeting. So if you guys could put information out for your for your community to make sure that you mention that. So we're hoping that more families can attend. Yeah. I, I just know that we're moving the meeting to the gym. For lighting and more space. I guess I would also. Sorry, go ahead. And oh, sorry, I have another question. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a question. Okay. Uh, my question was: Have we confirmed that Susan or Suzanne Clark is coming? Because I assume she still needs. To yes, I, I've been working with Susan. Susan and I are meeting Friday. One on the location. It just coming. Okay. I guess just for the purpose of, of naming things out loud, um, you know, I think that obviously there are members of this board who would probably greatly prefer that um, you know voters be encouraged to come out and uh, conduct the business of the meeting that's warned. Um, I think there are probably other members of the, the board. I, I don't know for sure, but my my guess is that there are other members of the board who would encourage voters to come out and um, again vote to adjourn the meeting. So I guess I just wanted to acknowledge that we're basically not talking about that because I think we're not in agreement about it. So, um, but again, I think there's value in at least just speaking it. Okay. Is there anything other else? Anything else related to? Oh, sorry. I, forgot again. Sure. I just know that the decision of the community to adjourn is the business. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, 4.6, which is uh, superintendent transition. And there's a couple of things uh, that we need to, or actions we need to take uh, under this. Um, the first, I think, would be acknowledging and uh, at the board's discretion, accepting uh, the resignation that Bill furnished uh, last Friday. That resignation letter is uh, in your packet. Yeah, I, I guess what I will say is that, uh, you know, I, um, there are many things I could say, uh, words of appreciation and acknowledgement um, and admiration uh, for Bill and for the things that he's accomplished uh, at Washington Central over the last seven years. Um, and really, it's quite a remarkable list when you think about it. Um, however, I haven't had time, to be honest, to really collect my thoughts properly. Express that well. Um, so, my lack of doing that now is not due to lack of praise or lack of deservedness, but just due to lack of uh, time and preparation to pull them together. Um, so, it's my intent to, um, you know, to uh, make that recognition and uh, you know, uh, give Bill service and accomplishments their due um, at a future meeting. Um, and I look forward to doing that. Moment, I'll just say how much uh, your work is appreciated, um, and you know it really has uh, done good things for kids. And I know that's what's most important to you. Um, and so, you know, in, in that sense, you've been tremendously successful here. Thank you. Thank you.
So if there's no further discussion and we're ready for the question, uh, all those in favor of accepting the resignation, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So next would be, and I apologize for speaking so much, I really should have delegated some of this to other executive committee members. Um, but I will just note that the executive committee did meet for this meeting to discuss in general terms uh, some of the questions that um, we'll have to answer about um, you know, if we go out to uh, uh, conduct a search for a superintendent. Uh, some of those questions involve would we want to hire a third-party consultant to, uh, with expertise in that area to assist us in that search. Um, our consensus, preliminary consensus at the moment is that we would want to do that. Uh, a second question involves whether um, we would be looking to uh, hire an interim superintendent or go out and search for a uh, longer-term permanent superintendent. Uh, I would say at the moment, although it, it bears further discussion, is leaning in the direction of um, that an interim superintendent is probably more appropriate to our current circumstances and uh, you know, the sort of state of flux uh, that the system is in. Um, and the executive committee, I think, um, you know, wanted to offer uh, to the SC board and not ask uh, that this work might be delegated to the executive seems like a more expedient way of handling the process than to try to ask the SU board uh, to meet as much as I think will be necessary uh, in order to carry out that work. Um, so that's kind of where we got to. So at some point, we can entertain a motion to that effect. Uh, but I just want to recognize that Charlie has circulated a memo about this, um, specifically about some of the information I sent out that I got from this, the uh, Agency of Education <coughs> School Board Association. So I just want to ask if you wanted to speak to that at this time. Or you? Yeah, the purpose of the memo is just to uh, elucidate that the question of whether uh, this union will have a superintendent lies squarely with the board, not with the AOE. Uh, and, and maybe that's what the AOE meant when it uh, provided, <coughs> or provided the board with a top uh, citation. Yeah, I don't think it's covered. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my conclusion, though, is kind of aligns with what you've already said. It seems to me that we're moving into a different place, and we're going to likely have a different board. It won't be us. We're all named ducks. And uh, the, the idea of uh, hiring a superintendent or not having a superintendent and shifting the, uh, the functions to, for instance, the principals. Uh, is something that I would say ought to be made by the new board. Um, and I would expect possibly that the issue of the control over uh, the direction that the school is taking, whether it be heavily um, uh, directed by the administration, whether the board takes a more active role, will probably be a subject of uh, consideration for the electorate. So for all those reasons, I would agree with what the executive committee is thinking about right now, which is that uh, maybe we would go with an interim superintendent. I think this, uh, the committee also ought to consider whether instead of that, we just do what the law allows and shift the, uh, the functions to the principals with a concomitant increase in, um, in salaries for them uh, for taking over those functions. A lot, of, there's a lot, that's you know 30,000 feet. In the I guess I would ask if, if it's uh, the board's decision to delegate this work to the executive committee, would you be comfortable without adding this to an agenda of a future executive committee meeting? No, it's a hypothetical. Yeah. Yeah. Adding what? Adding the discussion of this memo, oh, sure. considering yeah. the points that are made.
just because that should not be exclusively an executive committee decision. And I don't think we should delegate that authority. I think it's a broader discussion that we should be having, especially as we're moving into, probably moving into a different phase of our existence um, and what that means and whether or not we really do want to see a significant change in, uh, in how we operate. Um, to me, that would argue for an, in, uh, an interim um, so that we can have um, year-long conversations or at least half-year-long conversations among ourselves and with our communities. But I also think we should get a sense of the board, for the board as a whole as to what direction you'd like the executive committee to move in in regard to um, superintendent search. Uh, I, for one, Chris would agree. I think that I think that an interim supervisor, interim supervisor, uh, giving us a year, year and a half to have that conversation with the community about what we want to do going forward makes a great deal of sense. I think another argument in favor of an interim is that when an institutional organization is experiencing is in the throes of a lot of conflict, I think an interim can help move the process forward in a, in a, in a different way that a permanent leader can. Um, but again, I, I would be, if the executive committee, through its research or engaging with um, a consulting firm to help with this, started to shift in a different direction based on what you all were learning. I would hope that we could reopen that conversation, but at this point, I would favor the interim as well. I already got to speak at the executive meeting, but I, I, I favored the interim too, and I had a, about six reasons for, for that. I think it would give us a year to gather, like they've been saying, gather ourselves, uh, reassure our values as a, as a board. Uh, second, we won't have been on the paper every week. <laughs> and uh, so we would be more attractive and have a bigger pool of, uh, of candidates, uh, hopefully. And I, I think we're a great group of schools and leaders and educators, so I, I think we would be, and that would give us uh, a way to heal as communities and computer work. And also, maybe, and I don't know this for a fact, is the, we, would, we would be able to continue the work that we're doing right now at our, at our schools uh, and support our leadership team and this interim person could be somebody that has no stake in, in the community right now that could help us really heal so then we can pass that on to As far as an, excuse me, an interim, that makes sense at this late date as well. And there aren't very many people out there right now uh, in our state. And we have been in the news quite a bit, so I doubt there's people knocking at our doors. But um, I also feel that the idea of delegating the responsibility to the principals, if I was a principal, I'd be writing my resignation right now. And I am an educator. I work in schools, the principals, jobs are already over the top and they're there late and I think that would just scare me off and we don't want to lose our administrators so I think an interim <coughs> shows that we value leadership we value keeping our schools together and having a systematic approach to leadership so um, I think an interim is a normal way at this date when you're hiring somebody in this type of position, it doesn't mean the person couldn't prove themselves and stay on. Um, so that would be my vote. Go ahead. Um, that is a good moment to jump in and say that um, we talked at considerable length at our executive committee meeting, um, possibly more than any other topic, about how to
What I, I'd like to do is make a motion that the um, superintendent transition and search process be delegated to the executive committee with specific guidance um, from the full, from the Washington Central Supervisory Board that we want that to be an interim, a search for an interim superintendent and that we authorize the hiring of a consultant to facilitate that process. Lisa, did you get that? I wonder the scope of what the consultant would be hired to do. Uh, you know, in my view, I, I think the consultant ought to go do a deep dive and uh, look into whether uh, the paradigm of a superintendent is really the best paradigm for this community. Um, I think that's more of a task for the next board, but um, I hate to see us necessarily moving back into the exact same structure that we've uh, had all these years unless and until the electorate, indi indi electorate indicates that that's the direction it wants to go. So I think it's, it's a really good time for us all to um, objectively analyze what our needs are and how they align with the, uh, the, the culture of our community, or the town community. Okay, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think in part the, the consultant facilitator is I understand your point that there's a there's a question you're raising about um, you know whether that's in the direction we want to go, and I, I hear that I understand it. Um, I guess what I would say is that in the initial research that, that I've done, just looking around at either people or firms that do this, um, the costs of it range from you know anywhere from three to thirty thousand um, dollars. The thirty thousand dollars. The next item under this is that uh, my understanding, reading the um, uh, reading both the State Board of Education rule and the uh, material that we received from the Agency of Education, is that it's the responsibility of the chair of the SB board to notify the Secretary of Education when there is a pending vacancy and of the intent to uh, um, you know, conduct a search probably including details, preliminary details that we discussed here that at least preliminarily we're considering a, 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 uh, an interim superintendent for a shorter period of time. Um, I have not yet sent that letter. Um, I would greatly appreciate and even request a 
uh, motion to vote from the board uh, asking you to do that. So moved by Floor and seconded by Chris. Lisa, did you get that? I was sort of. So the motion, the motion would be to essentially direct the chair to send a letter to the Secretary of Education about the pending superintendency vacancy in Washington Central and of our intent to initiate a search. Is there any discussion of that motion? Yes, John. I wonder if it could be broken into two parts. <clears throat> I wonder if it could be Thanks. I wonder if the motion uh, could be broken into two parts. I support the notion of sending the uh, official letter to the secretary uh, that um, uh, our superintendent has, uh, has, has resigned due to um, you know, losing the position. But uh, I'm not so certain about But I don't think I would support the idea that we're indicating to him that uh, we wish or initiating a superintendent search. Uh, I would accept that as a friendly amendment. So uh, for this motion, uh, then Lisa, the awarding would be through superintendency vacancy, uh, but then remove the language about initiating a search for this particular motion. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Would you mind reading that back just so that everyone is clear? <coughs> Any further discussion of that motion? Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, and then there's a question of whether the board, uh, it's the board's pleasure to make another motion directing me to inform the secretary that we intend to initiate a search. Uh, Superintendent search, I should say. So Brian, you would make that motion. Is there a second? Chani? So for Chris, you know, I surprised Chris. Uh, but, you know, I'm happy to have the discussion and talk about it and um, see where it goes. And I think that initiating a search is not synonymous with completing a search. So we're going to start doing it. We'll take the steps and uh, go down the road. And if there are compelling arguments or the board's uh, desire is to stop that search or take another I would offer a friendly amending um, to say we conduct a search uh, which may result in the removal of the superintendent if we chose um, as so that we maintain our options. Brian, it's your motion. So oh, sorry, Brian. You... Okay, so accepted. So speaking to the new motion, um, I feel like we're already in a very difficult 
difficult situation where if we're going to move to get an interim superintendent, we're already facing a limited pool and, and uncertainty. To go with the language that we, that the friendly motion has just um, ad, added is going to make that even more difficult and even less likely that we're going to get viable candidates for an interim superintendent. Um, I mean, I don't think there's a, a, there's a convenient way around it. Either we're going to do a search for an interim superintendent or we're not going to do a search for an interim superintendent. And I don't, I, 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 I don't favor wordsmithing around it. We either are or we aren't. So to, to address the current motion, I would oppose it. Really? Are you able to uh, help us out by repeating the uh, current motion? Brian made the Brian made the initial motion, and then uh, and Chris offered a friendly amendment. Formally offered a friendly amendment. I don't believe that what Rick was saying was offered in that vein. Steve has it exactly right. I think we're looking at a very small pool. I think it may be constructive over the next year while we have an interim superintendent to have a discussion about whether we want to have a superintendent in the long term. But I think trying to make that decision tonight would not be in anybody's best interest, and particularly it would be incredibly against the best interests of the students of this SU. I'd like to second that. I, I, I have a feeling that, that the bulk of us, when we moved to charge, Suggest is that a motion has been made, and a friendly motion, a friendly amendment uh, suggested and accepted. Um, so at this point, not to make it laborious, but if you wanted to amend uh, the motion, you'd have to make a motion to amend it, I think. To, to, I, I would say to change the word uh, may, may result into um, likely will or whatever, you, whatever language you feel is more appropriate or acceptable. I, I would make a motion to amend it to strike the friendly amendment. To strike the friendly amendment. Okay. Or, or we could simply vote this motion down and start afresh. Right. Uh, well, you, I made a, you made a motion. I, I said, did make a motion. Is there a second to that motion? Floor of a second. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor to uh, strike the friendly amendment from the motion, the main motion. Um, so Lisa, I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> I apologize. If you could read the motion up to the point where the friendly amendment was inserted.
Let's take a, I think that first we have to uh, defeat Ruben's motion to amend or accept it at, at the board's will. So, um, or, or you can withdraw your motion, Ruben. I will cheerfully withdraw. <laughs> cheerfully noted. Chris made a friendly amendment will accept it. Can I just amend my uh, motion to I'll withdraw my friendly amendment? So okay. we're back to the main motion then. Yeah. Chris will withdraw his friendly amendment. We're back to the main motion. Is there any other discussion? This motion, yes. Charlie. Just uh, citing to the uh, regulations of the board of the uh, Vermont State Board of Education. Chair uh, shall notify the Commissioner of Education, i.e. the Secretary, as soon as the Board becomes aware of the impending vacancy in the Superintendency of the Supervisory Union District. Nothing in that section or any other section uh, obligates or even arguably permits us to give the Secretary an indication of what our intent is. So um, for me, I will vote against sending the Secretary any information about our intent. I guess I should say that the, the sort of rationale behind asking for this or suggesting it is that um, and I don't have that rule right in front of me, but maybe I do. I believe it's the last section of that rule uh, that um, uh, seems to permit Yes, 32.2 seems to offer the uh, secretary rather broad latitude in how he can respond uh, to the notification, even to the extent of possibly recommending to the state board changes in the supervisory union and district, uh, or possibly redrawing boundaries. This is how I interpret the language. Um, I have felt that by specifying to the secretary that we intend to uh, conduct a search for an interim superintendent for one year, that it seemed to be that he would be more likely uh, to accept that proposition without um, trying to change it or add it or monkey around with it. I guess that was the rationale for, for putting it that way. The rule of three is what I want to What's that? There's the rule of three. Well, so I don't want right, yeah, I've, I've been I'll talking to this. No, me, not you. I, I would concur with that interpretation. Others? We can come back to Charlie and I. I hear you loud and clearly. And if the rules were only in place, uh, I would agree with you. But the purpose of my memo was to articulate that the Rules adopted by the uh, State Board of Education do not 
not aligned with the, with the law. And uh, clearly the law takes precedence over the rules. And uh, just a matter of statutory interpretation of the rules, you gotta try to make them conform with the, with the statute, not make the statute conform with the, uh, with the rule. So uh, I don't know what it means to say that the super, uh, that, the, that the commissioner uh, will advise the chair that either the following two applies, the process for the creating new superintendent or uh, going to the state board to consider whether the structure will change. I do know that it's the commissioner will advise, so I guess the way I would reconcile the rules to the more important statute is the commissioner's uh, function is merely advisory. And I, at this point, especially given uh, the uh, issues around um, the, um, what I would consider the, uh, the fairly high-handed activities of the Agency of Education, I see no reason to uh, keep them apprised of what we're doing, unless we are obligated by, by law or rule. Because if the rule does indicate that you're supposed to notify the, and, and actually get approval, uh, is what three, what I think that's yeah, three, two, three, two. And if, you know, I understand your point that the rules can see the statutory authority given to the agency, uh, the commissioner, um, but if you want to say by the rules, does the same rule well, as a, as a uh, interaction between the So um, I'd like to weigh in. Uh, it doesn't, there's nothing that precludes us from informing uh, the Secretary of Education what we're doing. We've taken a vote in an open meeting and it'll be in our minutes. There's nothing secret about what we're doing. So I see no disadvantage, I see no downside of just acknowledging to the Secretary of Education what we're doing. Can we just call the question? Is that okay? Uh, we can call the question unless there's somebody that wants to continue the debate, in which case it requires a two-thirds vote of the body to um, stop the debate. So, so one point of order, you can't. Oh, once the question is called? Yep. Okay, then. So the question has been called, uh, I'm sorry. For well, and, and there's interest in continuing debate, so we must vote on Okay. Well, or two thirds not. Two thirds okay. must approve the motion to call the question. Calling the question is essentially a, a motion to uh, end debate and vote immediately on the motion to let it end debate. Uh, so um, at this point, we need to vote. If you're voting aye or yes, uh, you can hold up your card. We need to do a count on this one because we need two thirds of voting members present. If you're in favor of uh, calling the question and stopping the debate, and uh, thank you, you can put your arms down. And those uh, voting nay. So the vote is 11 to 1, and the motion to call the question passes. At this point, we'll move to voting on the main motion. Those in favor of um, approving, directing the chair to send a letter to the Secretary of Education indicating our um, uh, intent to initiate a uh, superintendent search, please signify by saying aye. Point of order? Yes. The motion is for an interim superintendent. For an interim superintendent, thank you. Uh, those in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. No, it's not. I don't think it is. Do we? Stand but is that, but what are we voting on? That's what. All right, Lisa, I'm going to ask you to read the motion one more time with apologies and thanks. Okay, I thought the last time around we agreed that having interim in there was not part of the original one, so this motion does not do that. Okay, so, it's, so it is to direct the chair to direct a letter to the Secretary of Education indicating our intent to initiate a search. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Aye. Uh, the ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Motion carries. <coughs> I must
once we have um, burning questions or issues to share in the reports, I think we're going to probably uh, skip over those. We have action agenda item 6.2. Uh, we need to, uh, is there a motion to authorize the supervisory union to accept all federal and state grants and to administer and to act as a representative of all member school districts of WCSU? Thank you. 